cricket in India is not just a sport, it's a religion, a passion that unites a diverse nation of over a billion people. The Indian men's national cricket team, also known as the Men in Blue, has evolved over the years, leaving an incredible mark on the world stage. From humble beginnings to becoming a powerhouse in international cricket, the journey of the Indian cricket team is a tale of perseverance, dedication, and sheer brilliance. All of which we'll be exploring in this video. Like many things in former colonies, the history of cricket in India can be traced back to the British. In the early 1700s, when the British were basically scamming India for all it was worth, they introduced the game of cricket, organizing the first official cricket match in 1721. The first Indian group to adopt the game were the Kolis of Gujarat, and this was actually a strategy by the British. You see, the Kolis were outlaws and were always about looting British ships. So the colonizers considered using cricket as an opportunity to lure in and manage the Kohli's, and it worked. It wasn't until 1848, though, that the first Indian-run cricket club was formed. It was formed by the Parsi community in Mumbai and called the Oriental Cricket Club. As you might expect, the Europeans were not immediately welcoming of this new development. A new cricket club owned by non-Europeans? It probably didn't make sense to them. So, no. Indian cricketers were not allowed into their club. Eventually, though, and for whatever reason, the Europeans invited the Oriental Cricket Club to play a match in 1877, 29 years after the club was formed. Another milestone year in the history of Indian cricket is 1912. At this point, what you could call indigenous cricket had taken off quite a bit. Aside from the Parises, the Hindus, Sikhs, and Muslims of Bombay had gotten into cricket playing at some point. But in 1912, all these groups were invited to play a quadrangular tournament with the Europeans for the first time. And they continued to play this tournament every single year. So it wasn't completely surprising that some Indians were invited to play, not against, but on the England cricket team sometime in the early 1900s. Two of the early Indian members were Ranjit Singhji and Dulip Singhji and they were so good that even the British got wet watching them perform. In fact, those two got to have cricket tournaments named after them, the Ranji Trophy and the Duleep Trophy. Now, the actual Indian cricket team as we know it now was officially founded in 1932, but there was some kind of cricket team in India as early as 1911. The team, which was captained by Bhupinder Singh Patiala, even went on official tours of the British Isles. However, they only ever played English county teams, they never got to play the English national cricket team. But things started to come together for the Indian national cricket team in 1928 when the Board of Control for Cricket in India, BCCI, was formed. And then in 1932, for the first time since cricket was introduced to India, the Indian team got to participate in test cricket, which is basically the pinnacle of international cricket in the world. Because of this, most people consider 1932 to be the official start of the Indian national men's cricket team. The team that got to play test cricket in England was captained by C.K. Naudu, who was considered the best Indian batsman at the time. Unfortunately, this was not a good run for India, even though they had a really good batsman. For whatever reason, they struggled in their batting, losing the match by 158 runs. Thankfully, that did not result in their cricket playing card being revoked. They actually got to host the test series the very next year, in 1933. Unfortunately, they lost that one as well. Worse still, while they continued to improve and play at different international tournaments, they never won an international victory throughout the 1930s and 40s. Well, part of the reason they didn't win anything in the 40s was because of the Second World War. They didn't participate in any international competitions during this period, but local cricket tournaments like the Ranji Trophy continued. Unfortunately, all of that cricket training during the war was not enough to give India an edge in the international cricket space because they continued to not win competitions even after test matches were restarted after the war. They played their first series as an independent country in 1947, and still did not win that one. However, that match remains iconic because aside from the fact that India played as an independent country, it was also their first time playing against a country that was not England. Ironically, India's first test victory was won against England at Madras, now Chennai. This was in 1952, and it was India's 24th match against England. Vinu Menkad's all-round brilliance played a pivotal role in this historic win, 
setting the stage for the team's gradual ascent in the cricketing world. They won the very next year against Pakistan and again in 1956 against New Zealand. Unfortunately, the rest of that decade wasn't the best for India as they lost badly to both Australia and England. Thankfully, by the next decade, India had gotten their mojo back. They won their first test series against England at home in the 1961-62 season and then won again at home against New Zealand. In fact, while there were a couple of losses in the 60s, the Indian team managed to pull off a lot of wins, including against one of their neighbors, Pakistan. However, if you're thinking of the decade that India really solidified itself as a force in the cricketing world, you're probably thinking about the 70s. A big part of the team's success in the 70s was the Indian spin quartet that consisted of Bishan Singh Bedi, E.A.S. Prasanna, B.S. Chandrasekhar, and Srinivasaragavan Venkataragavan. This team basically came to show the world that the Indian cricket team meant business, especially when it came to bowling. Sunil Gavaskar and Gundapa Viswanath were also key to India's success during this period. They were some of the best batsmen that India or even the rest of the world had seen. It was a good thing that India's team had greatly improved by the 70s because in 1971, the men's one day international, ODI, cricket was introduced. That said, in spite of the good players that the team had, India wasn't exactly considered strong in the ODIs. Their batsmen were more known for their defensive approach, which worked brilliantly for the test matches, but not so well for the ODIs. So when the Cricket World Cup, which is played in the ODI style, was launched in 1975, India could not make it past the second round. They also did not make it past the second round the next year. Interestingly, though, they continued to smash the test matches, especially when they played at home. Their style of play was just perfect for that kind of competition, and they even managed to set a then test record in 1976 when they chased 403 to win. Later that year, they broke yet another record, scoring 524 for nine against New Zealand. And what made that even more iconic was the fact that no individual batsman scored a century. By the time the 1980s rolled around, the Indian national team had become a lot better at playing an attack-centered game. A lot of this had to do with the new guys that were brought in, including Mohammad Azaruddin, Dilip Vengsarkar, Kapil Dev, and Ravi Shastri. In 1983, India won their first ever Cricket World Cup, defeating two-time defending champions West Indies in the final. As you might expect, this was not a win that anyone saw coming, even after India had managed to make it to the final but they won and did it in grand style. And it has to be mentioned that Kapil Dev's iconic innings of 175 against Zimbabwe in the group stage and Mohinder Amarnath's all-round excellence were instrumental in India's historic victory. The 1983 World Cup win laid the foundation for a cricketing revolution in India, inspiring a generation of cricketers and fans alike. And the image of Kapil Dev lifting the trophy remains etched in the collective memory of Indian cricket enthusiasts. This, however, does not mean that it was smooth sailing for the team from there on out. Sure, they won more international competitions in the 80s, including the Asia Cup in 1984 and the World Championship of Cricket in 1985. But there were also some losses, including the test matches that they had started to dominate at one point. In fact, about the test matches, 1986 would turn out to be the last time that they would win the tournament for 19 years. There were still some individual milestones reached, though. For instance, Sunil Gavaskar, who served as the team's captain sometimes, made a test record 34 centuries as he became the first man to reach the 10,000 run mark. And Kapil Dev, who served as the team's captain the other times, became the highest wicket taker in test cricket with 434 wickets. Pretty good for a team that some would have considered unstable at the time. The 1990s witnessed a transition phase for Indian cricket, marked by a blend of experienced campaigners and young talents. Sachin Tendulkar, often referred to as the Little Master, emerged as the face of Indian cricket during this era. Debuting at the age of 16, Tendulkar's talent and insatiable hunger for runs made him a cricketing icon. Unfortunately, while he did make a name for himself, he was not enough to give the Indian team the wins that they needed in the 90s. The team also got Javagal Srinath, 
who was considered one of India's fastest bowlers, but it also wasn't enough to buy them enough wins. Sure, they won 17 out of their 30 tests at home, but out of the 33 international tests that they participated in, they won zero. A number of changes were made to the team, including a change in leadership and new additions to get them back to their winning ways. But they still were not enough to grant the Indian team the win that they so desperately needed at that point. It was so embarrassing that Tendulkar, who had been made captain after the team failed to reach the semifinals at the 1999 Cricket World Cup, resigned and vowed to never captain the team again after the team had made one too many failures. Unlike the turn of previous decades, the turn of the Naughties was not exactly pleasant for the Indian team. In 2000, Mohammad Ajaruddin, who was the captain at the time, was implicated in a match-fixing scandal, alongside Ajao Jadeja, a fellow batsman. The BBC described this period as the Indian cricket's worst hour. However, while there is no denying the gravity of that kind of scandal, it ended up being the wake-up call that the Indian team needed. The core members of the team swore to never let something like that happen again and to lead Indian cricket out of the dark mess that it was in. As a result, the team, once again, underwent some major improvements. This new and improved team was coached by John Wright, India's first foreign coach, and captained by Saurav Ganguly. Somehow, these changes worked because India found themselves in a kind of winning streak following that. In 2002, they became joint winners of the ICC Champions Trophy with Sri Lanka. Then they reached the final of the 2003 Cricket World Cup in South Africa, where they unfortunately lost to Australia. But they came back with an ODI series win against Pakistan in early 2006, which gave them the world record of 17 successive ODI victories while battling second. In September 2007, India won the first ever ICC Men's T20 World Cup. And then in 2011, they became the third team, after the West Indies and Australia, to win the World Cup. They also became the first team to win the World Cup on home soil. In 2013, they picked up another record, as their captain became the first men's cricket team captain in history to win the three major ICC trophies, which are the Cricket World Cup, the ICC Men's T20 World Cup, and the ICC Champions Trophy. The 2010s were, unfortunately, not as good as the 2000s. There were losses like their run at 2014 ICC Men's World 2020, the 2015 Cricket World Cup, and the 2016 ICC World 2020. But there were also a number of wins like the 2016 Asia Cup, where they remained unbeaten throughout the tournament. Now, they didn't exactly win the 2019 Cricket World Cup, but it was still a defining one for the team. For one, they finished first in the group stage with seven wins and only one loss, which was against host country England. Second lie, they ended up losing to New Zealand at the semis, but at least Rohit Sharma, current captain of the Indian national cricket team, came away as the highest run scorer with 684 runs. So far, the 2020s have really not been that bad for the Indian team. Sure, they lost to England at the 2022 T20 World Cup semifinals and lost to Australia at the 2023 ICC World Test Championship final. But they have also won the 2023 Asia Cup final against Sri Lanka, with one of their players, Kuldeep Yadav, emerging as the player of the tournament, and also secured a gold medal at the 2022 Asian Games. As for the 2023 Cricket World Cup, India won Australia, went on to defeat New Zealand at the semi-finals, but then got beat by their former opponents, Australia, in the finals. However, former captain Virat Kohli came away as the highest run scorer of the ODI World Cup with 765 runs. This was his 50th ODI century at the Cricket World Cup, which is a standing record. The Indian cricket team's journey is far from over, though. There is still a lot of room for the men in blue to fly. So I guess we'll just have to wait and see. And don't forget to watch this video on how India won the Cricket World Cup.